have said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Two hundred years ago, Longfellow wrote those words. If you look at the news today, you listen to what is happening around the world. We've got another airplane gone missing. We've got protests around the United States against our policemen. We've got soldiers coming home, hopefully for the last time from Afghanistan, but still there is no peace in Afghanistan. There's no peace in Iraq. There's no peace seemingly throughout the world. We have people who created a nativity scene with zombies or whatever they're called. We have a lady in France stealing the baby Jesus from a manger to make a point. We have a lot of things happening. I think about a hundred years ago, I don't know the exact year, but there was a ship that was making her maiden voyage from England to the United States. And on that great ship, there was a lot of parties going on. And on the night of April the 14th, messages were received in the radio room of that ship that warned of icebergs in the North Atlantic that had broken free. And when the radio operators on that ship received the message, they laid it aside because things more important were happening and they were sending messages from people to all different parts of the world as they were sending out their Morse code messages of greetings and ex explanations of what was happening on that great ship. As they entered the area of the icebergs, another ship sent a warning to them. And the radio operators, when they received that radio message, used their Morse code and they sent out the message, Shut up! Shut up! We're busy! Shortly thereafter, the Titanic hit the iceberg, and over a thousand souls were lost. <laughs> warnings. How often do we get warnings and we ignore them? Warnings about travel and how to travel and what to watch out for. The blizzard conditions that shuts down I-70, although there's not a lot of snow, it's blowing snow. And when you have whiteout conditions or blizzard conditions, you can't see. But I've been driving along the interstate, and I have to admit, I'm guilty. Going to Ohio one year, we were driving from Kansas City to St. Louis. 
and it was pouring down rain. It was sheets of rain. It was just coming down. And here I am with all the other idiots out there running 75 and 80 miles an hour on the interstate. All it takes is one person to make one mistake. And you've got a massive amount of warnings. Warnings that we fail to heed could be concerning our health. could be concerning our lives, our travel. It could be concerning carbon monoxide in a house. Not having a carbon monoxide alarm almost caused two people from Walmart several years ago their lives. If it had been for the fact that we made a phone call to the police, they would be dead today. God gives warnings. God told the children of Israel what was going to happen to them because of the sin of following after other gods. And the Assyrians came and took the kingdom of Israel captive. And the kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes of Israel, are no more because they were swallowed up in history. The king of Assyria came down to Jerusalem to attack Jerusalem, and Hezekiah takes and lays out the letter that he received from the king of Assyria before God and said, God, here is what this man is saying. And God delivered Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem and the people of Judah from the hands of the Assyrian. But He warned Judah, change your ways. And following Hezekiah's death, his son Manasseh begins to rule. And Manasseh rules for 55 years in Jerusalem as king of Judah. He was 12 years old when he became king. The Bible describes his reign this way. In this temple and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I put, will put my name forever. I will not make, uh, not again make the feet of the Israelites wander from the land I gave their ancestors, if only they will be careful to do everything I commanded them, and will keep the whole law that my servant gave them. But the people did not listen. Manasseh led them astray so that they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. God had said to His people, when you go into my land, when you go into this land that I am giving to you, if you will only be obedient to me, I will bless you. I will multiply you. And you will be a kingdom forever. But the stubborn people, the descendants of those stubborn people who came out of the land of Egypt as freed men from slavery, who rebelled against God time after time after time, their descendants living in Jerusalem now have become more evil than all of the people who lived in the land before God brought their forefathers in the capital. If you read and take time to read the book of Second Chronicles and just, just take it and, and read the, the history that is there, <clears throat> and you see how the people, how the kings led their people astray. And Manasseh 
is one of the worst kings. He leads his people astray. He, he, he puts idols in the house of God, in the temple of God. He puts the Asherah pole in. He does all kinds of evil things and, and worships many different gods. He is perhaps the worst king that Jerusalem ever saw. <clears throat> And God takes him captive and sends him to the country of Assyria as a slave with a fish hook through his nose. And while Manasseh is in this foreign land, he repents of his sin. And God forgives him and sends him back to Jerusalem and to Judah. Manasseh sees his sin. In his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. And when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea. So he brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. And then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. Manasseh repented. And God forgave. You know, it doesn't matter how bad people are. How evil men or women have become. It doesn't matter what they have done in their lives. It doesn't matter how evil that is. Whether it's the killing of mass number of people. Or just no killing at all. But just an evil, hateful person. A person who repents and turns to God. Is. Forgiven. Manasseh had a son by the name of Ammon. And he came to be king, become king when Manasseh died. And he too did evil in the eyes of the Lord, as his father Manasseh had done. And Ammon worshipped and offered sacrifices to all the idols of Manasseh, uh, all the idols Manasseh had made. But, unlike his father Manasseh, he did not humble himself before the Lord. Ammon increased his guilt. And he was assassinated. Reigned for two years and was assassinated. Throughout all of the time of the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, God sent messengers. He sent warnings to the kings, to the people, to tell them, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to live. And after Ammon was assassinated, his son, Josiah, comes to power as king. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. After he had reigned for 18 years, when he was 26 years old, he went into the temple and he had the temple and all of the temple compound completely rebuilt had all of the idols taken out of it, had restored the worship of God to the temple in Israel. All right, the temple in Jerusalem. In the process of the cleansing of the temple, there was a book found. And when the priest found that book and began to read it, he wept. And he took it to Josiah and he read the book to Josiah and Josiah wept. Josiah tore his clothes. 
Josiah fell before the God, before God, because of the words of the book. The book was the book of Deuteronomy. And if you go back and you look at the book of Deuteronomy, you find out that when God spoke through Moses to the children of Israel and says, when you enter into this land, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to occur. And if you fall away from me, you are going to go into captivity. And Josiah heard those words and he cried out, God, is it true? God said, yes, it's true. <clears throat> and so Josiah led his people in a time of great revival. He reinstituted the Passover. Hezekiah had done one Passover. Now Josiah does another Passover. And it's like no other Passover that has ever been held in Israel. Josiah was a man after God's own heart. He was a young man and he sought God with all of his heart. With all of his mind. With all of his strength. And God said to him, Josiah, it's too late. Your revival, your renewal is too late. My people have gone so far astray that they will never come back. But because of your revival, I will not exact my punishment upon my people until after you. In the year 605, Josiah is 39 years old. The king of Egypt is fighting the king of Babylon. And the king of Egypt comes up through the land of Israel. And he is going to cross over the pass of Megiddo into the valley of Jezreel so that he can go fight. And Josiah goes out to stop him. And Josiah is killed. 39 years of age. But goes out and tries to stop a war and in the process is killed. The Babylonians now come. And the Babylonians begin to attack and lay siege to the kingdom of Judah. And the Babylonian king takes Judah captive over a period of ten years. Following Josiah's death in 605 and 609 B.C. at the Battle of Harpagus, in 605 B.C., the Babylonian king takes the king Jehoiakim, his royal family, the priest, and the intelligentsia of Judah, prisoner takes them into captivity. One or several of the young people that went into captivity during that first captivity, the first time of captivity in 605 B.C., was a young man by the name of Daniel and his three friends. Again, in 597 B.C., King of Babylon comes against Jerusalem for the sins that they have committed and 
he takes another group of people captive. And this time, one of the captives that goes into captivity is a young priest by the name of Ezekiel. And so from 597 until 587 B.C., Ezekiel prophesies to the captives in Babylon. We've studied something about Ezekiel and Daniel. As uh, we've studied in the Sunday school lesson as we began this, this study here. But Ezekiel speaks to the people that are camped in Babylon. And he sees visions of what is happening in Jerusalem, the holy city. And there is another prophet that speaks to God's people that warns them and says to them, this is what's going to happen to you if you do not repent and return to God. And that prophet's name is Jeremiah. Jeremiah was <coughs> imprisoned several times. He was thrown into a well once. The king didn't want to listen to Jeremiah because every time Jeremiah prophesied something, it was against the king. It wasn't what the king wanted to hear. But Jeremiah was speaking to a people that were hard-hearted, who disregarded all warnings. And he wept over his people. And when the last group of captives were taken captive, Jeremiah was taken by some of the rulers and taken down into Egypt where he continued to prophesy. But there was a man, another man of God, not just Jeremiah, not Ezekiel, not Daniel, but this man was a man whose name was Habakkuk. You ever look at the prophecy of Habakkuk. Habakkuk was an interesting man. He didn't, he didn't have a message from God to prophesy uh, to the people, but he went to God and he cried out to God, God, you are a righteous God. You are an everlasting God. You are a God who lives forever. And you have a people here who are spoiling your name, who are defiling your name. They are not living up to your standards. And you, God, are letting them continue to live in their sin. Why? You're righteous, God. How can you let your people live like this? Because when they do... They defame your name. They despoil your name. They do away with everything that you are. How can you tolerate? And God says to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, I want you to know that I am going to bring punishment on my people. I am going to bring the Babylonians down. And if you look at it, Habakkuk is only three chapters long. And if you look at the description God gives of the Babylonians to Habakkuk, it's, 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 a, it, it's really interesting as he, as he describes. You look at the, you, you get this visual picture of, of this horde of horsemen coming down and all that's going to happen. And, and God says, Habakkuk, I am going to bring the Babylonian army and I'm going to use the Babylonians to punish my people. In the back of it. God, wait a minute. Your people are sinful, but you're bringing an even more sinful people to punish your people that are holy. It don't make sense. Habakkuk couldn't understand God. He 
And God says, that's what I'm going to do. Because there is going to come a point in time in 70 years that the sin of Babylon is going to reach its fullness and I'm going to punish Babylon because of what they do to my people. God gives us warnings. God says to us as human beings, as individuals, obey me and I will bless you. Now that doesn't necessarily mean physical riches because some of us are quite poor. We have needs, yes. But God says, I will bless you. I will watch over you. I will protect you. I will keep you safe. I will guard you. I will give you strength when you are weak. If you obey me, I'll bless you. But if you sin against me, I am going to punish you. The book of Hebrews says that God disciplines His children whom He loves. Any good parent will discipline their children to help them to become better. And so when, they, when a child sins, when a child goes astray, the parent is to be there to call them to repentance and to get them to go on a right way. And that's what God does. So God blesses or God punishes. Throughout the story of the Bible, we see men continually rebelling against God. Men and women. I'm not leaving the women out here, okay? But we see people rebelling against God with no thought of what tomorrow holds. We live in a country today that is in rebellion against God. It seems like more and more every day things happen that causes us as a nation, that us as individuals to go astray, to turn away from God, to forget God, to deny God. I read a story yesterday about a minister, pastor of a Seventh-day Adventist church, Last year, he made a New Year's resolution that he was going to live for a year without God. And to see what it was like. And in the story, in the interview, he admits now that he is an atheist because he does not find any proof for the existence of God. And I said to myself, how can this be? How can you not find proof of the existence of God? Now the Bible nowhere seeks to prove the existence of God, for God is. We look at the stars, and the stars is handiwork I see. Look at the flowers. Look at the things that are happening. And we see God. But we're warned as a nation that any nation that deserts God, that any nation that forgets God, that any nation that turns from God is not going to last forever. As individuals, our challenge is to continue to live for God. And even though we may go astray occasionally, God is there and patient and brings us back. Manasseh repented of his sin and God forgave him and restored him. Ammon, his son, was too proud to repent of his sin. And he died a violent death. You see, as we live life, you and I know that living life as believers, that we cannot live, that we cannot survive, that we cannot go from day to day with all of the different things that happen without Him. 
For without Him, I could do nothing. Without Him, I'd surely fail. Without Him, I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. That's a perfect description of what happened to the Jewish or to the children of Israel and to the children of Judah as they deserted God. For without Him, they were dying. And without Him, they were enslaved. And without Him, they were hopeless. But with Jesus, thank God, I'm saved. God promised to the children of Judah and to David that there would come a one, come a man, come a, a king after David's own heart that would truly live and be God's spokesman over. We saw last week that Isaiah prophesied the coming of the Messiah. We see today that Jeremiah says that there will be a restoration of the people of Judah back to Jerusalem because God forgave their sins. that comes through Him. And thank You that He is with us. Help us, Father, to continue to walk with Him, to trust in Him, and to live for Him a life that is true. For it is in His name I pray.